One of my favorite stories involving Marvin Minsky is when I asked him about how he was able to turn out so many fantastic PhDs, so many fantastic people who did great th- PhD theses. How did he think of all these great ideas? And what he said is he would generally say something that didn't exactly make sense. He didn't really know what it meant. But the student would figure like, oh my God, Minsky said this. Yes. It must be a great idea. Oh, and he'd so awesome. sweat. He or she would work on work and work until they found some meaning in this sort of Chauncey Gardner-like utterance that Minsky had made. So and then some great thesis would come out of it. Yeah, I love this so much because th- there's um, young people come up to me and I, I'm distinctly made aware that the words I say have a long lasting impact. I will now start doing the Minsky method <laughs> of saying something uh, cryptically profound and then uh, letting them actually uh, make something useful and great out of that. <laughs> you, you have to become revered enough yeah. that people will take as a default that everything you say it, is profound. It's, yes, exactly. <laughs> Exactly. I I mean, I love Marvin Minsky so much. There's so much, uh, I've I've heard this interview with him where he said that uh, the key to his success has been to hate everything he's ever done, uh, like in the past. <laughs> <laughs> he has so many good like one-liners and just, uh, or, or also uh, to work on things that nobody else is working on because he's not very good at doing stuff. Oh, I, I I think that was just false. Well, but see, I took whatever he said and I ran with it and I thought it was profound because it's Marvin Minsky. No. Uh, but I, a lot of behavior is in the eye of the beholder and true. a lot of the meaning is in the eye of the beholder. One of uh, Minsky's early programs was begging program. Are you familiar with this? Mm-mm. So this was back in the day when you had job control cards um, at the beginning of your IBM card deck that said things like, how many CPU seconds to allow this to run before it got kicked off and um, because computer time was enormously expensive. And so he wrote a program and all it did was um, it said, you know, give me uh, 30 seconds of CPU time. And all it did was it would wait like 20 seconds and then it would print out on the operator's console teletype um, I need another 20 seconds. So <laughs> the operator would give it another 20 seconds. It would wait. It says, I'm almost done. I need a little bit more time. Uh, so good. at the end, he'd get this printout and he'd be charged, you know, for like 10 times as much computer time as his job control card. Yeah. You know, and he'd say, look, I put 10 seconds, you know, 30 seconds here. Yep. Um, you're charging me for five minutes. I'm not going to pay for this. And the poor operator would say, well, the program kept asking for more time. <laughs> and Marvin would say, oh, it always does that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I love that. Is is there, if you could just linger on it for a little bit, is there something you've learned from your interaction with Marvin Minsky about artificial intelligence, about life? Uh, but I mean, he's, again, like your work, his work is, uh, you know, he's a seminal figure in the in this very short history of artificial intelligence research and development. What have you learned from him as a human being, as a as an AI intellect? I would say both he and Ed Feigenbaum impressed on me the the realization that our lives are finite, our research lives are finite. We're going to have limited opportunities to do AI research projects. So you should make each one count. Don't be afraid of doing a project that's going to take years or even decades. To And don't settle for bump on a log projects that could lead to some you know, published journal article that five people will read and pat you on the head for and and so on. So one bump on a log after another is not how you get from the earth to the moon by slowly putting additional bumps on this log. The only way to get there is to think about the hard problems and think about novel solutions to them. And if you do that, and if you're willing to listen to nature, to empirical reality, willing to be wrong, it's perfectly fine because if occasionally you're right, then you've gotten part of the way to the moon.